Talking about the legacy of the company, because that is pretty long. I mean, started after World War One, I, I guess. So just get giving the, the legacy story of Bell Ships, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting story. It's been here for a long time. The history of Bell Ships really started with a fascinating piece of innovation because at the time you had general cargo ships uh, sailing around and shipping general cargo. And the founder of Bell Ships came up with an idea to create the first uh, heavy lift vessels in the world, actually to transport uh, locomotives and railway equipment on deck. And that was the business for the first uh, decades. They've been involved in most uh, segments uh, you can think of. And uh, since the 1930s, actually, one family through three generations had been involved in the company. Once you took over, you said you had a personal strong conviction of the company based on the acquisition and merger. What was the, the pitch that made you so interested in taking lead on that? The unique part of Bell Ships at that time was that you had a listing, you had a hundred years of history, so you had a strong uh, brand name. Bell Ships is one of the, the companies who first started contracting ships in, in Japan, and you can trace it back to the late 70s. And then with the merger, the market cap of the company uh, went from $30 million uh, to about $100 million. So what appealed to me was this was a chance to take a great name and make it a vestible make it relevant for uh, for a wider audience uh, and see where we can take it. Last year was, I guess, exceptional. How would you summarize the last year? Over the past three years, uh, there's been a lot of unexpected uh, surprises, both positive and negative. We made more money last year than our market cap was four years ago. And that's obviously because of a strong market, but also the exceptional growth uh, we've been through. Ironically, a lot of the effect from the pandemic in 2020, even with lockdowns and these things, were reversed and it, it came together and, and produced, I think, a better market than most people expected. How is your macro view right now on, and also on the years going on right now? Do you feel bearish or do you feel like there is still room to grow in the market? That's one of the fascinating things about shipping because it's so integrated in the global uh, economy and it really fuels a world GDP. Or you can turn around and say world GDP fuels uh, shipping. So with the inflationary pressures now and recession fears, shipping is an interesting place uh, to follow. For shipping, it's about managing these uh, cycles and it's very difficult to predict the demand side because it's so varied. The biggest factors in the dry bulk market is the Chinese economy being the biggest demand source the dry bulk market and also iron ore and both of those are currently a bit uncertain with the lockdown in China and also less than normal iron ore uh, coming out of Brazil. We've actually been quite bullish for the last couple of years and felt it was a good point in the cycle to build up a company and and expand the fleet around uh, the autumn. We we changed subtly a bit tech uh, so we we started chartering out a lot of our ships for one and two years and we've been doing that for the past six to nine months. So I think maybe a bit differently from other uh, listed companies, we actually have quite a bit of charter uh, coverage uh, right now. So for the rest of this year, we basically have 70 to 80% already covered. And for next year, we have about half of the fleet covered. So we felt like the risk reward to charter out the ships and, and, and take down a bit of the uh, market exposure uh, has been prudent. We can have a pretty constructive view of dry bulk uh, supply and demand over the next let's say two, three years, because the supply of new ships is steadily decreasing. For dry bulk, we're approaching a supply situation which hasn't been seen in more than uh, 20 years. It's approaching three decades since the last time we had so few new ships coming into the market. And also when you have inflation, uh, shipping is actually a not a bad place to be invested because we have hard assets and that appreciates if you have uh, inflation in, in the economy. How would you summarize sort of the different type of fleet Bell Ships has compared to other shipping companies who are also in the dry bulk space? Yeah, the simplest way I usually explain it is that we have the biggest ships in the world with cranes and we use cranes to discharge and load the cargo. And our ships go up uh, all rivers and, and deltas around the globe. They're extremely versatile. We ship more than 100 different cargoes per year. And if you look over the past three or even 10 years, the segment of Supermax and Ultramaxes have actually done the best. And every time you have a downturn, they outperform every single other dry bulk segment. For me, it's, it's important in shipping to invest on the same side of uh, economy of scale. So you want the biggest ships within each uh, cargo 
or, or trade flow. And what you tend to see when there are uncertainties, for example, now with the, with the tragic situation in, in Ukraine, there are Christian marks over, over wheat exports. You have uh, rain and flooding in Australia, so you have question marks over coal exports. And what happens is that the ships who rely on one or two cargoes only, they tend to be more volatile, whereas our ships, they find other cargoes. If you took a heat map of the globe, the trading pattern of our ships looks like a children's drawing. So it's, it's more versatile and it's more uh, protected to shortfalls in one area or one uh, cargo. You've been acquiring so many vessels, sold many. What's been the biggest lessons from a financing perspective and, and what is the right financing also? Financing is such an integrated part of ship owning investments. We set us up using the Japanese leasing market, which enabled us to finance brand new ships for periods of uh, around 10 years with fixed interest rates. The advantages of that are several. First, we get fixed interest rates for the entire period. You also have a duration of basically twice of what you get from the normal uh, banking or bond market uh, here in Europe and the US. So you have a longer uh, tenor. For us, it's also been a way to approach the green shift. We've essentially sold our ships to a structure where we uh, have control of it for, for a period of 10 years. And during this period, we have options to repurchase the vessels. Uh, but at the end, we're not obliged to uh, purchase the vessel. Over the next five years, uh, a lot of things can happen with technology, propulsion system, fuels, and all these things. So instead of sitting with old ships, and doing nothing or moving too quickly and and building more ships with nobody needs which are only marginally better than yesterday's ships with 75 uh, percent of our ships financed this way we can actually turn around the company 180 degrees we finished last year selling all our so-called non-eco ships we completed one of the quickest uh, modernization turnarounds of a fleet and the vessels we have today are the top 10 percentile in terms of efficiency. But we expect that the, the things might look different in 2025 to 2030. And so we've taken a financial approach to that.